at this time of, of social distance and, and, and uh, um, cocoon and all of that, they, we have to look for alternative ways to, to do these things. And, uh, by law, or by direction of the government, we're not supposed to go more than two kilometres from our home. But I suppose if we were to leave our home any day and travel two kilometres in, in the parish of Boris, we would see a lot. So, what we're going to do is we want to paint out a few of these things, tell a few of the stories about them that we hope we entertain them. And, uh, uh, you know, cases of interest, stories of interest, uh, all pertain to Boris Lee. And uh, we have a little presentation here, a number of slides that depict what we're doing. And uh, Tracy is going to read a few little bits and pieces uh, relative to, 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 to what we're showing. Uh, Boris Lee, Glen Keen, we were, we were Glen Keen before we were Boris Lee, and for a while we were Glen Keen in age. Uh, to that was uh, rectified, I think, by, by uh, a father of Bowen that was here back in 1802. Uh, he met us an entity of our sons again. And uh, you can see the, 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 the early photograph of Glen Keen and uh, the gate we into it. You know, one most historic lady has, not only to pray, but in, in, in all of Ireland. To his, to his profession. And I have there a uh, book versus Mahane. Now, what was book versus Mahane? Uh, a man called Martin Burke to go into the Shelburne Hotel. He, he sued Pierce, Pierce Mahane for assault. And he sued, he sued Mahane. Mahane is sort of outside, um, outside College Green. And um, uh, Burke took him to court. Uh, there was another thing, so two things involved in it. Uh, one, one was um, that um, Burke owned it, um, a place called Sea Paint, sea paint House in Clantaf. And uh, it was on the, 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 the route, the proposed route that would take you from, uh, that would take the new train, say, from, from Dublin to, to uh, Dunleary to Kingstown. And Mahoney wanted Burke to make way for that, but Burke wasn't cooperative. But there was another side of his view going on as well, and that was that Mahoney was a shareholder of the Bank of Ireland, and, uh, uh, and he, was, he, he was on the board of the Bank of Ireland. But Burke was a shareholder, Mark Burke was a shareholder, but his son, James Milo Burke, was an executive of the, 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 the Agricultural Commercial Bank, and a number of, Martin Burke wrote a number of letters to them. To, to the, the parents, very critical of, of, of Mahane, and this was the genesis of, of this news. Now, what's all that about is this fellow here, Dr. Edward Kelly, who, is, who was an ornament of his profession. And if you see the little inscription there, not the little inscription, uh, erected by uh, Miss Lizzie Kelly in the memory of her husband, Dr. Edward Kelly, later from Morris Lee, who departed this life on the 16th day of July 1837 in the 34 year of his age. Now, sincerely and deservedly regretted, he was an ornament to his profession, an affectionate husband, an attached friend, and blessed with all those amiable qualities that he valued society. His sorrow and widow and children will ever mourn his loss. Now, if you want to make a better epitaph, could you, could, you, could you wish for? Uh, the, now, the court case between Mahoney and Burke took place on the, the, it was on the, he died on the 16th of May, on the, on, 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 it, he died on the 16th of July, 1827. The court, court case took place on the 24th of June, three weeks, 22, 22 days earlier. And <clears throat> Kelly was not a medical witness, he was not the chief medical witness. He, 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 he went to, and he testified to the court of common pleas that he saw uh, Martin Burke in good head one day and then the next time he saw him was all marks and bruises. So which begs the question, what, why did uh, Dr. Kelly go for Boris Lee to testify on behalf of Martin Burke? And I'll tell you that in a minute. Who else is very angry uh, or amongst others is a man called George Burke and George Burke was um, 
a, a, a solicitor, a powerful orator, a, a friend of uh, the young Irish, uh, father John Kenyon, and all of those, and he was highly respected. And the day that he died, uh, or the day he buried again, he uh, the report of that is a very interesting read. <clears throat> Death of George Burke Esquire, Solicitor Thurless. Our readers will sympathise with the bereaved widow and children of the above young, active and energetic gentleman when they hear of his premature unexpected death after only two days illness of gastric fever at his res residence, Lis Cahal, within a short distance of Thurless, at half past ten o'clock on Sunday night, the 26th instant. There was no man in his profession more better known throughout the length and breadth of Tipperary than George Burke, and there are few in any rank who at all times took a more decided part in public business than he was accustomed to take. In the politics of his native county, even in his early years, he was always prominent, whilst with the general politics of the country. He was thoroughly identified with on all occasions. In private life, there were few more amiable, kindly disposed or highly esteemed by his numerous friends. While in the midst of his family, he was beloved for his social and excellent qualities. He possessed a large share of ability, as well as in his profession, as in the details of public business in which he took part. And he was a ready speaker, a clear and clever writer, and in each of all the parts which duty called him to undertake, he was particularly adapted to become distinguished by those gifts, which naturally largely endowed him with. His death has caused widespread sorrow wherever he was known. In his neighbourhood, grief is intense and we need not add to his family. His loss is irreparable. The mortal remains of the lamented deceased were conveyed for interment in the family vault in Glenkey, Boris Lee, on Wednesday at one o'clock. They were accompanied by at least 30 clergymen and the concourse of symp sympathising people was immense. All the shops in Thurless, Borisley and many in Tuckamore were closed and the deepest regret prevailed through I.B., the ancient district in which his ancestors had lived for many generations. The, the, the history of the Shelburne Hotel is an interesting study. And uh, the, it's a change of ownership or management, whatever. Uh, the, the hotel they engage historians and genealogists, genealogists and researchers. You know, to document the life of the hotel since, since it began. Now, Mark Burke was the man who began the hotel. He bought the property for £3,000 at the time. That was in the 18th and It was a huge sum of money, and the rent was £300 a year. Uh, there, there's no um, no one, we don't know how he made that money. But the researchers and all these people who studied, they, they, they knew he was from Tipperary, but could never define where in Tipperary he was from. So, uh, because of Dr. Kelly going to testify at that shrine, uh, uh, John, uh, I would have surmised Kelly's wife was forward uh, and her mother was born. So, if he was going to testify, I would have said that, that you know, in, in, uh, in support of his kids, his you know, family, his, the member of his extended family. Now, uh, Martin Burke was involved in another famous, famous infamous, infamous uh, trial as well, but the trial of Gavin Duffy. And uh, Duffy was accused of treason in the capital trial. And it was in the age of packed jewelry, and, and uh, uh, a conviction was, was um, inevitable. Now, there is a, a petition in Dublin, you know, for, for, for that, that a number of Catholics would be on the jury. And this was headed by Isaac Bosch, he, he was the defence counsel for, for uh, Gavin Duffy. Now, uh, the authorities would concede eventually to, to, uh, to, to grant him one Catholic businessman to be on the jury, and that's why I felt in Martin Bork, but the felt to be. Uh, no, a middle class businessman, and, you know, who side to be on. And Bush was about to object to, to the inclusion of work on the jury. So, 
The night before the trial began, uh, Gavin Duffy's wife, she went, she, she went to uh, Burke's wife and she, she told Burke's wife that Burke's I said Burke's would not object her, her husband would be on the jewel. And she said that, you know, why like, you know. But she says, um, if, if, um, if, if uh, your husband is convicted, she says, Martin need, 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 need not bother with her at home. Uh, they, they went to the court in, in Green Street and they set a cross from, um, from, from the witness stand. And when Martin Burke was given evidence, his wife and his daughter were looking at him. So he, he, he had no trouble. But, but uh, he, he, he gave a number of statements about it. You know, these appeared in debates in the House, the House of Commons. And he, he made himself quite unpopular for a while, he did. But, but uh, only for him, uh, Gavin Duff would have been convicted. They, they tried to keep it out of attention. The people lost appetite for the things moved on. Um, how do we know it's from Borussia A man called Patrick Burke Ryan. Um, he wrote a letter to Daniel O'Connell. The, 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 the Protection of Life Act was, was, was uh, going before the House of Commons. And that was to despair ordinary people from carrying weapons. And, and O'Connell was adamant in his objection to this. And, Patrick Ryan wrote to him and he said, I support you in every way, I can't support you in this one. He said, My two brothers were murdered. He said, In Boris Lee, uh, mine were born in Springfield in 1828, and in 1836, uh, his brother Andrew Bork was, was um, murdered in, in a cool Union. And Ryan then said in his letter, he said, and he said, my other uncle, he said, Martin Burke of Shelburne was afraid to come down, he said, to collect his rent, and he sold the, the property. So, so that firmly puts Martin Burke as an heir to the Borough of So it was a Borough of Saline I found in Shelburne Hotel in Dublin. Um, the Cowan match, please, the name of the position there. The, the, the power match is an annual pilgrimage, of course, for not you know, farmers and non farmers And it looks like this year we're not going to, we're not going to have one. But back in um, 1945, we had one in Boris City, and, and apparently by the read of the report, it was a common enough for Horace, it was. County Tipperary Power Championship at Boris City, Wednesday, January the 17th. The roads that day would be a sight to see with the crowds advancing so gallantly. From Nakshigami to Bohabui, blazing the trail to Borisali. Our little town has again been selected for the county ploughing championship in the beautiful Vale of Lys, kindly given by Mrs. E. Cook, Fort William House. We heartily welcome the cream of Tiberi stalworth ploughmen to compete for the honour of the county in one of the noblest professions of man. It is our pattern day in Boris, a special holiday between the Christmas and St. Patrick's Day. A real old Irish kindliness will be extended to all our visitors. On a spring morning with the lift of the thrush in the grove, you can't escape noticing the glad eye of the shrove. The very best of refreshments and full catering in town and on the field. Class 1. Championship class open to North Tipperary. Prizes. First prize, five pounds. Second, three pounds. Third, two pounds. Best open and best furrow, ten shillings. Entrance fee, five shillings. Class two, open to all those in North Tipperary who never won. First or second prize at any plough match. Prizes, first, three pounds. Second, two pounds. Third, one pound. Best open and best furrow, 10 shillings. Entrance free, 2 shillings, 6 pence. Thanks, Vincent. <clears throat> Alice Morrison. Who, who was Alice Morrison? Um, her age story is in St. Bridger's Cemetery. It, uh, it tells a story, really, you know, for so many years, the faithful housekeeper to, to uh, Father Ryan, Cabin Ryan, that was, that was here up to. Uh, uh, they died in 19, uh, 1928, 27, 28. Now, um, Alice Morrissey was from the Cashin area, 
comes to some around Cashel. And uh, when when uh, Sir, when Colonel Ryan died, Sir Bill had come in his place, which effectively made Alice Morrissey homeless. And Mrs. Cook of Liss took her in, you know, just all charity, and she gave her a room in the house. And Alice Morrissey lived there in that room, and you know, for, for, and until the day she died. Um, in her time in Morris, in Morris and Lee, um, she, she met a number of friends, and people would call up to visit her occasionally. And one of those was Tim Cosgrove at the, the post office. And uh, t t Tim would call up you know, and have a chat, and whatever like that. And, and, um, uh, one day Tim Cosgrove went up and he visited Alice Morris. And when he came away, he, 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 he met he met Mrs. Cook and he said, Alice Morrissey, Miss Morrissey wants to speak with you. Now, what Alice Morrissey wanted to do, she had, she had 400 pounds that she wanted to lodge in the once and then the bank of Temple Moor. And she wanted Mrs. Cook to put her name on the, the deposit note. And Mrs. Cook consented to do that, provided that um, Alice Morrissey made a will. Uh, it just showed the, the statue of the woman Mrs. Cook was. In all this, there was no uh, everything had to be above board. Um, the, the will was made, written out in plain paper. Uh, Jim Kent and uh, William Kent were taken as witnesses. They didn't, they didn't actually witness the will, they witnessed the signatures that were signed for it. And the will was pushed away. Alice Morris uh, died in 1933, and uh, she left her money to. Uh, St. Patrick's College in Torres. And uh, out of the blue, uh, a number of cousins turned up out the woodwork to claim their share of the, 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 the money. And uh, uh, like all these things at that, that time, or any time it was, when money is at stake, it ended up in court. And uh, you know, a number of witnesses were called for, for each side. And uh, Mrs. Coop was called on, on, um, on, on behalf of. Uh, of um, the estate of Alice Morrison. And uh, the solicitor said to, said to Mrs. Coop, he said, it's, it's very unusual, he said, that, that a, a will would be drawn up in that form. He says, it must have done in the solicitor's office. And she said, she said, I know that, she said, and I wanted, I wanted uh, Alice Morrissey to do that, uh, but she wouldn't do it. She, says, she said to me, why do you give them a scam or some and they do it ourselves or not? Um, when you went to Forest Lee on the church on the right hand side, up the, up the main aisle, the, the middle window, it was, the, the money for that was donated by Alice Morris, a lovely, a lovely stained glass window. Um, another stained glass window, two stained glass windows in the gallery of Forest Lee, uh, donated by Brendan Bracken, a central first day at least. We can see there J.K. Bracken. Lord, to the father and mother, to two lovely windows, and uh, certainly didn't come cheap in their time. Um, Brendan Bracken was minister, was Churchill's minister for information during the course of the Second World War. Um, the, the founder of the Financial Times, um, you know, a high power man, uh, you know, well known in publish. He kind of gets a bad press in Ireland. You know, but he was very kind to his family, to his extended family. You know, and he was, he was, you know, it was an air of decency about him. So that maybe content wasn't, wasn't um, certainly in his family. You know, and his dealings with people, and uh, little idea the Glen Keegan on the the, the gable of the chapel. You know, in, in memory of, uh, of Brendan Bracken's mother, uh, and the, the right family, the right family laughing. When, when, when Hannah Bracken, when she became widowed, she later married her cousin, uh, Patrick Laffin from Castellina. And um, they, they, they lived in war park in, in County Mead. Calling him Castle. Um, the seeds of the Lord of Wilds. You know, when you're coming to Boris Leaf and the leader side, you know, it, 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 um, it, it really. Really straight up in the hill there, you know. And some pretty gruesome stories about it, you know. The back from the old wire time. But if you come on a little bit later in history, and uh, to uh, 1850, uh, 
Uh, something happened there. That's that's uh, uh, certainly pretty gruesome for our, you know, for certainly by today's standards. Anyway. Friday last, there were about locality of, of Colahill, near Borisali, was a theatre of the most soul-harrowing scene. This property has lately come into the possession of Mr. John Parker of Ballyconiton, New Nina. And wishing to get rid of small holdings and amalgamate farms, he issued a haber and to carry out his intentions was on this day accompanied by his brother and his law agent, Mr. Daxon of Nina. At half past eight, they appeared on the land with a gang of about 20 of the notorious levellers of Nina. At nine o'clock, the worthy sub-inspector, Mr. Malone, with about 40 of his police from the different stations, was on the spot. And shortly afterwards, the sub-sheriff, Mr. Going, on his way to open the commission in Nina, which his deputy, Mr. Gason, and his chief clerk, Mr. Burroughs, also arrived. It was truly an awful sight. The poor rate collector with his seal of office, along with the county cess collector and his staff, filled up the awful cavalade. The place of rendezvous was Collihill Cross, near Mr. Burke's residence. Mr. Jackson, the law agent, was with Mr. Burroughs, the chief clerk, and the Crowbar Brigade, with half the police, filed to the southern district of the ancient castle and levelled 11 houses and turned the poor inmates out upon the highway. The Messrs Parker and Mr Carson and a party of police under the sub-inspector took the northern district directing their route towards a rick of turf in hopes of discovering a nest of arms but without success. And melancholy to behold, in a few hours 470 human beings were disposed from the town's land of Colahill, Corrakeil, Carrageen, Coralie, and the bog at Mount Canaan. Out of these 470, 299 were readmitted as caretakers. The remaining 241 were left out under the clemency of the weather. You know, when we say that in 1850, the second of August, 1850, um, just, I suppose, at the end of, of the horrific famine, you can maybe understand then how, the, you know, the failure movement in 1867, you know, how they, they, that they attracted. Um, in all of this, you know, um, Daniel O'Connell, during his, his, um, his campaign for Catholic emancipation, again in 1829, <coughs> you know, he, he was, he was um, pretty successful in that, he was, even though it did create a Catholic elite in its own way. Because um, I spoke earlier about the 40 shillings um, uh, freeholders. Um, Catholic emancipation was granted at a, a huge cost. That now, instead of having 40 shillings of valuation, you had to have 10 pounds of valuation to, 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 to have a course. So, a huge, a huge raft of people disenfranchised because of that. And after that, O'Connell reinvented himself as, as a, to, re, to repeat the act of union. And the uh, likes of George Burke that I spoke about, and, and, um, and the father of John Kenyon. Uh, because of the famine, uh, you, you know, they, 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 they are they are the vain that they, that's, that's a, that the peaceful methods were of no use anymore, you know, and uh, I suppose not without reason when you see that. Um, in 1902, a huge land agitation to break up the, the remnants of the state of Baronet, the Carroll estate. Uh, the John J. Hassett, he, he, you know, after, after what John J. Hassett spoke about, and he said, it's very easy to understand the, 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 the nature of the, the, the fight for land and everything that you're playing. He said, from 1850 to 1898, um, the 30,000 people have been evicted, 
and their, their house is leveled. So, you know, these things don't happen in isolation. You know? So you can imagine that that report that three read from the Tipperary Vindic Theatre, uh, the three man journal gave a much more damage indictment of all that were involved. You know, it gave a, uh, you know, a potential description of, of uh, you know, what, what it said about uh, such, such, a, uh, such an intake for Taurus Workhouse, 500 in, in one go. Uh, the, the doctor had the dispensary. Uh, the dispensary back in 1895, when, 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 when the time that these pertained to, uh, that was in Palace Street, and it could be where uh, the offices of the spring, spring water facility is there now. Um, or a little bit above there. They, they lay in one in there. Uh, I, I remember when I was young that when they said the dam is used to sell milk out of it. Funny enough, you know, the, 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 the problems, you know, being talking about obesity. Yeah. Back then, when, when the, we were supposed to have no obesity, they still had a, you know, they had enough of a problem to raise about it, they had it, and to circulate doctors about it, and they don't to give suggestions how to deal with it. Um, uh, I'd imagine much of the 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 farm the the the, 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 the labour or the, the, the whatever like I don't think they ever had much of a problem with obesity. But uh, but uh, amazing this was on before the day of Weight Watchers and the gym and the track attack and all of that. Um, in the middle there, uh, I don't know, if you want to become a doctor, but how difficult was it? And it kind of says there like the barrel was in that high, you know, you know if you if you, if you and then, um, matters enough results like in an exam to be, be um, well, called the intermediate certificate. Now, uh, I kind of saw a bit of too, but I then further into the book, some of the questions that he asked like to be difficult enough to do it, you know. And for an end, the notices, um, um, this was um, up, to, up, to, up to the, the, the early 50s. This system was still in place. Like if we want to go to the doctor now and phone up uh, Catherine and we say, well, Dr. Delaire, we see me at such a time, and we just go with her. Or when Dr. Powers there, we just went and we sat down and we waited. But at that time, it wasn't that easy, it wasn't. You, you had to get a ticket to go to, uh, to, to the doctor. And uh, here's a list of people that had uh, the privilege of giving you that ticket. George E. Ryan, Inch, House W. P. Hanley, Lanes Park, John D. Cook, Brownstown, Captain Armstrong, Myalif, Clement Green, Green Park, George R. Cook, Fort William, Richard G. Carden, Fish Mine, Lawrence Ryan, Finnehan, John McCormack, Grand Era, Thomas McCormack, Grand Era, Thomas Ryan, I. Michael Kelly, John Gill. John Ryan, Glen Breda. Rody Hogan, Fantan. Patrick Finn, Castle Quarter. James Kennedy, Cougar. John Burke, Ross Cottage. Edmund Canaan, Gurtna Halla. Dennis Stapleton, Palace. Philip Burke, Palace. M. H. Ryan, Liss McKeeve. That's was. You know, when we think of that, that is the names, I think of the whole system, you know, to, to, to grossly unfair, you know, in that, uh, you know, even stories of survival, they can't this but, you know, when people got this ticket, you know, that's the place to, to, to got some of a compliment, and certainly people went out in the gate, uh, and, uh, you know, you know, thank God we moved on from that. Like, we have um, a man buried in Glenkeen that we would like to thank for the, the change in those times. That, that shame is broken up for us. But you know, he wasn't the man who changed, who changed uh, that system. I think it was, it was uh, Lord Brown. Uh, it was the man who, who uh, did away with that. But uh, Burger Rock Forest was the man who, uh, who, uh, was the man who uh, finished the, the, the workhouse system, the pool law. You know, something that's forgotten about. You know, the great, the great initiative you know, on behalf of you know, underprivileged people. Move on. Um, 
Da har så stillet en, en, en helt lagt for seg. Øh, Alle vei. Det var en trener av den gutten, doktor til lærer, og så vet man ikke noe. Det beste var han for seg, men peit musik, og det var så stort, og det var en stor 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 uh, 1922. Um. Forest Rural Council, Sewer Scheme for Borsley. Several communications were read from Dáil Éireann, local government of department at Thurlis Gardens on Tuesday, sanctioning payment to doctors for doing temporary duty, etc., and were of little public interest. Bridget Manners' appointment as temporary nurse of the Fever Hospital was approved. On a report of Dr. Joan in reference to the waiting room at Boris Lee Dispensary, in which there was no fire during the winter months. They wrote for particulars and the clerk explained that the coal was sent there on occasions, but irregularly. And two or three years ago they had stopped to supply coal to any dispensary. Mr. Morrissey thought if they supplied one dispensary they would have applications from all other dispensaries. The clerk said, we have no means either of checking the coal sent to those dispensaries. They might take it and burn it in their own homes. To a member, the clerk said the owner of the dispensary at Forest City was Michael Darmody. He was getting £5 a year rent and Mrs Darmody £5 as a caretaker. The chairman said he only knew a few dispensaries where there was waiting rooms. The kitchen of the caretakers were used as such. The clerk said Mr. Darmody applied some time ago for three or four pounds for repairs and it was held up that he should keep the place in order. Up to then he was to keep the place aired and lighted, fires etc. The garages thought a fire necessary and granted half a ton of coal. At the rural council Mr. T. Ryan presided. Don Aaron wrote in reference to unable nuisances and the sanitary arrangements of common lodging houses in Borsali, asking for particulars. The clerk said there was no common lodging houses in Borsali district, and those that traded as such did not come up to their requirements. It was decided to get the IRP to look after those houses. With regard to the sewage system in Borsali from from time to time, the clerk stated, for the last 20 years, he never met a minute that there was not some complaint made about the sewage system in Borsali. And when he came to the point of preparing a scheme, and when everything was ready for it, the doctor objected after talking and writing about it for years. The discharge comes out within a couple of hundred yards of his home, and it is likely to be offensive. It is a think that must be done sometime. Whether it would be wise now to do it when labour and materials have increased, he did not know. Very